Hello! How's it going, everybody? Alright, so, welcome to fourth quarter. An exciting time. Lots going on. Um, we are going to start looking at hypothesis testing. All right, And this is pretty much the topic that's going to carry us through the end of the year. All right, We're going to look at it from a bunch of different directions. We're going to look at it with different types of data. But most of what we're doing from here to the end of the year is hypothesis testing. All right, so what is a hypothesis test? Well, a hypothesis test is a formal procedure for comparing observed data So like what we gather from an experiment or from a survey with a claim whose truth we want to assess. All right, so the general idea is Somebody's making a claim. We're then going to conduct a survey, conduct an experiment, gather data, and then we're going to try to make some statement about the validity of their claim. Is it accurate? Does the data support what they claimed? Or is there not enough evidence to suggest that any of that is, is really kind of true or not? All right. So let's take a look at an example here. Suppose a basketball player claimed to be an 80% free throw shooter. All right, so there's the claim. To test this claim, we have him attempt 50 free throws. He makes 32 of them. His sample proportion of made shots is 32 out of 50, which works out to be 0.64. So... This right here is our observed statistic. All right, we had a claim. The claim was that our free throw shooter was 80%. We then conducted an experiment. We had them shoot 50 free throws. They made 64 of them. So based on that data we gathered, what do we think about the original claim that he's an 80% free throw shooter. And you might be saying to yourself, well, it's wrong because he only shot 64%. But you have to remember that when you gather data, there's always going to be some random fluctuation. You know, for example, if I were to uh, flip a coin a hundred times, you wouldn't expect to get exactly 50 heads and 50 tails. You'd expect for there to be some random variation. You might end up with a few more heads, you might end up with a few more tails, but you wouldn't necessarily expect it to be 50-50. So, just because somebody's an 80% free throw shooter doesn't mean they're going to make exactly 40 out of 50 shots every time they try, try it out. Sometimes they're going to make a little more than 40 shots, sometimes they're going to make a little less than 40 shots, and what we have to say is, or what we have to try to figure out is, 32 out of 50, is that possible? Is that within the bounds of random fluctuation? Or is that so far from 40 out of 50 that we can say that the, the claim was probably wrong? This person isn't really an 80% free throw shooter. All right, so that's, that's kind of the general idea of what, we've been doing, what we'll be doing here. So what can we conclude about the claim based on the sample data? You know, maybe he's telling the truth. All right, right now we don't really know. I would say that it's kind of in that gray area. You know, it's not like he only made 10 shots, um, but... 64% is, you know, a, a little ways from 80%, so it's, it's kind of hard to tell. So what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a formal procedure so that instead of having to sort of like do it by gut feel, 
we can run it through a calculation, we can run it through our process, and then have a more mathematical answer instead of a, yeah, maybe, maybe not. All right, so it says we can use software to simulate a thousand sets of 50 shots, assuming that a player is really an 80% shooter. All right, so imagine we had a computer, and the computer said, all right, 80% of the time I'm going to make the shot go in, and 20% of the time I'm going to make the shot miss, and then it just started taking random samples of 50. So it, just, it would go through and do this 50 times and say, all right, let's see how many they made 50 times, let's see how many they made 50 times, let's see how many they made 50 times, over and over and over and over and over again. All right? One thing we could check is how many times did this computer shooter make 32 or less shots. All right, so let's say we run it through the computer simulation and eight times. We'll say that eight times out of the 1,000, um, the shooter makes 32 shots or less. So we can put that as a proportion and we can say, all right, eight out of 1,000 times, which if we were to convert that to a percent would be 0.8%. All right. And the way we can think about this is we can think of this as the probability of getting an observed statistic of 0.64, which is what we got in real life, if, and this is the big part, if the shooter true ability is 0.8. So we're saying, if this person is truly an 80% free throw shooter, there was only a 0.8% chance that in 50 shots, they would only make 32 or less. All right, so that's a pretty low percentage. All right. So down below here, it says, if the observed certificate if the observed statistic is very unlikely when we assume the actual parameter value is 0.8, it gives us convincing evidence that the player's claim is not true. All right, so let's talk about that a little bit. All right, so there's, there's two options when you get a result that's really small like this. All right, option one is that you just ended up with one of the unlucky samples, all right, because when our computer did this, it did happen eight times. So it's not like it was impossible for it to happen. It just didn't happen very often. So option one is that we ended up with an unlucky sample. Option two is that our initial claim was wrong. All right, so we're kind of stuck between these two options. Do we think that we got a really unlucky sample? Or do we think that our initial claim that this person makes 80% of their free throws is wrong? And the threshold that we usually use is 5%. All right. If this value right here is under 5%, then we assume that chances are our initial claim was wrong. All right. If this value is above 5%, then we don't have enough evidence to really say one way or another. All right, so that's kind of the, the threshold that we use for things like this. All right, so let's take a look at the back here. All right, all right so let's get into some of the vocabulary that we're going to need to use when we're talking about hypothesis tests. So the first thing we're going to have is a null hypothesis. All right, and the null hypothesis is the claim being assessed. The claim being assessed. And it is usually, 
a statement of no difference. Alright, and what do I mean by a statement of no difference? We usually write it as h sub 0, that's our null hypothesis, and we say the parameter equals a value. We're saying it's no different than whatever value we think it might be. All right, and then the alternative is the claim we're trying to find evidence for. All right, so the claim we're trying to find evidence for and we usually write that as h sub a for alternative and that's usually going to be that the parameter is either less than greater than or not equal to some value all right it's going to be one of these three and then you're comparing it to some value all right. So a quick note, hypotheses always refer to a population, not a sample. So you want to make sure that you're stating H sub 0 and H sub A in terms of population parameters. So what that means is when you're talking about a mean, you would use this symbol, not our X bar. All right. We don't want to use X bar. All right. When we're talking about Proportions, all right, you would use P, not P hat. Again, just because when we're dealing with hypothesis, it's always referring to the parameters, not the statistics. So we want to use the symbols for the parameters. All right, and the P value, all right, is the probability, all right, this is what we calculated on the front there, the probability of observing a value as extreme as was actually observed if the null hypothesis is true. So again, going back to our little example there, it was the probability of observing 32 out of 50 shots or less, assuming that the person makes 80% of their shots. All right. And then the language or the statements that we're going to end up using over and over and over and over are as follows. We're either going to be writing because the p-value is so small and then we usually state whatever it was I reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative. Hypothesis. All right, so when you get a really small p-value, like the one we got on the front there, 0.8%, we would say because the p-value is so small, I reject the null hypothesis, which means I'm rejecting the claim that this person's an 80% free throw shooter, and I accept the alternative hypothesis, probably that, you know, they're worse than 80%. All right. The other one that we write is sort of the opposite because the p value is large. And then again, we would state whatever it actually is. I fail 
to reject the null hypothesis. All right. And notice here that we never accept the null hypothesis. We just say that we fail to reject that. And the reason is, is that the null hypothesis is a very specific statement. It's saying the parameter is equal to 0.8. It's very hard to know something that specific. I mean, we might think it's 0.8, but what if it's really 0.799342? Or what if it's really 0.8000463? It's such a specific statement that we can never be 100% sure that it's true. So we never say that we accept the null. We just say that we fail to reject it. We haven't found enough evidence to say that it's wrong. The reason that we're allowed to accept the alternative is that's a much more general statement. All right, The alternative is usually like, oh, the parameter is less than some value, or it's greater than some value, or it's not equal to some value. And that's, that's far more general. If I say it's less than 0.8, that gives me a lot of wiggle room. It might be 0.7, it might be 0.6, it might be 0.78, it might be 0.32, but it's much more general. So we're allowed to accept alternatives, but we never accept a null. All we can ever do is fail to reject it. All right, so let's take all of this vocabulary and again, put it in the context of our little basketball example. All right, so we've got another sheet here. So we're back to our basketball example. If we were gonna write a null hypothesis for that, we would write it as H sub zero. That says that it's our null. And we're saying that the proportion equals 0.8. That's our starting claim. Now, we might think that the person's really not that good, so our alternative is that P is less than 0.8. All right, so that's how we would write both of those. And then our conclusion would be because our P value was so small, and in our case it was 0.8%, I reject the null that this person's an 80% free throw shooter, and accept the alternative hypothesis that this person's true th free throw ability is less than 0.8. We're not saying what it is. We're not saying like it's 0.63 or it's 0.62 or it's 0.65 or whatever. We're just saying that we're fairly certain that it is in fact less than 0.8. All right. So when we're doing this hypothesis testing, um, on that previous sheet, I said you could either do less than, greater than, or not equal to. And based on what you pick, it's either considered a one-sided test or a two-sided test. So a one-sided test is used when H sub A states that a parameter is less than or greater than the null hypothesis. All right. And you can probably guess this, but a two-sided test is used when H sub A states that a parameter is 
different. And different is basically just another way of saying not equal to from the null hypothesis. All right. So what you have here, and it doesn't really show up well on this sheet, is but when you're doing greater than, you're basically looking on the right side of the curve, and you're seeing, does your event fall in what we call the rejection zone? All right, but the rejection zone is only on one side of the curve. When you do less than, your rejection zone is over here on the left side, and we're seeing how you know extreme was your result. Was it way over here where it was super unlikely? Was it way up here where it was super unlikely? And then with the two-tailed test, it's a little different because you have a rejection zone both on the upper side and the lower side. All right, Both of these end up being rejection zones where we're allowed to reject our null hypothesis. Okay. All right, so let's get two more definitions down and then we'll stop this video and go over to a new one. All right, statistically significant. All right, this is when the p-value falls below the alpha level. and we reject the null. All right, so we've used the term statistically significant before. We said it was more than you would expect from random chance. And now that we're in this unit, we're gonna see that in more detail, that's when we reject the null hypothesis. When we reject the null hypothesis, we're saying something is statistically significant because it's giving us evidence that our initial claim is not true. All right, and then the alpha level is the threshold p-value that determines when we reject the null. And what we're going to find is that most of the time in here, um, we're going to use 5%. And then the other one that you'll see a lot of times is 1%. So this is usually 5% or 1%. That's the threshold upon which we sort of reject the null. All right. All right. Welcome back. So. Continuing on with this discussion of our alpha level, which is basically the threshold at which point we reject the null and accept the alternative. Um, quick note, it's important that you choose this before conducting the test. All right? And as I said on the last page, it's usually 5% or 1%. But if you choose it after looking at the data, it allows you to bend the results to support your conclusion. So, you know, maybe... Originally, you were going to pick 1%, but then you do your experiment. The p-value comes back at 3%. So you're like, yeah, let's change it to 5% because I want my results to be statistically significant. So it is important that you're making these decisions ahead of time so that you're not sort of bending the data and bending the results to kind of fit the narrative that you're trying to tell. Now, you might say to yourself, like, why would anyone do that? It actually does happen. Um, there's a whole problem called p-hacking, which is where you manipulate your data to try to get the p-value to be significant. And the reason you want the p-value to be significant is because that's the, resor that's the research that's more popular, that's the research that gets more attention, and if you're trying to get funding for your lab or funding for your project, you generally need to find statistically significant results so there's this 
motivation for people to sort of manipulate the data to sort of reduce um, their p-value. There was a comedian, um, John Oliver, who did a piece on p-hacking um, and people use, how they can manipulate data and stuff to um, get the results that they're after. All right, anyways, moving on, making errors. All right, so we have this process set up, but it's not 100% guaranteed, all right? If we think back to the very first example, I said there were two possibilities. One possibility was that the original claim that the person was an 80% free throw shooter was wrong, and the other possibility was that we just got a really unlucky sample, all right? So we don't ever know with 100% certainty which of those two it was. All right, so what we have is we have what are called type 1 and type 2 errors. A type 1 error is when the null hypothesis is true, but we mistakenly reject it. So going back to our basketball player, our basketball player truly is an 80% free throw shooter. We just happened to get a really bizarre sample where they only made 32 out of 50. It can happen. It's not likely, but it can happen. And if we reject the null when we're wrong, that's considered a type 1 error. All right. So a type 2 error is sort of the reverse. It is the null hypothesis is false, but we fail to reject it. All right, so here you can imagine a situation where our basketball player isn't an 80% free throw shooter. Maybe they're way worse, but when we gather data, they happen to have a really lucky day. They make way more than they usually make, and then we don't reject the null because the data didn't support it in that random case. So you could have unusual samples in either direction that, that cause you to make an error. All right. Another way to think about this is to think about it with our court system. All right, so in the United States, we always say that you are innocent until proven guilty. So being innocent is the null hypothesis. That's our starting point. The alternative would be that the person is guilty. So a type one error is when we convict an innocent person we're rejecting the null and accepting the alternative, but we're wrong. So a type one is convicting an innocent person. And a type two error occurs when we let a guilty person go free. So the, the, the person on trial did whatever they were accused of, but we were not able to prove it or we let them go mistakenly. All right, so that's just kind of another way to think about it. And then we've got this little table here that sort of breaks things down. So if the null is true, then the only error we can possibly make is a type 1 error. If the null is false, the only error we can possibly make is a type 2 error. Another way of looking at it this is when we reject the null, the only type of error we can make is a type 1 error. And when we fail to reject the null, the only type of error we can make is a type 2 error. All right? It's impossible to reject the null and make a type 2 error, just the same way it's impossible to fail to reject the null and make a type 1 error, just based on kind of how, how this breaks out. Because when you, the null is false and you reject it, that means you made the right decision. All right? When the null is true and you fail to reject it, that means you right, made the right decision these would be the two situations where you're kind of making the wrong decision. All right, so this idea of type 1, type 2 error is going to be important when we're kind of looking at our sample size, when we're looking at our threshold values, and all of those other things.
All right, so let's take a look at some practice questions. All right, awful accidents. One way for the city manager to measure response times is to look at the proportion of calls for which paramedics arrived within eight minutes. Last year, paramedics arrived on the scene 75% of the time within eight minutes. The city manager wants to determine whether they have done significantly better this year. Okay. So, state an appropriate null and alternative hypothesis for the test. So, again, the null is our statement of no difference. So, in this case, no difference would be saying that P is still equal to 0.75. The alternative hypothesis, you kind of have to get from the question. This one says the city manager wants to determine whether they have done significantly better. So they're trying to see, has this percentage increased? So we would write our alternative in this case as H sub A, P is greater than 0.75. So again, this would be a one-tailed test because we're using greater than or less than. So, describe a type 1 error in context. So again, a type 1 error is when you reject the null and you're wrong. All right, so you reject the null and you're wrong. So in this case, rejecting the null would be saying, all right, P is not 7.75, we think it's higher than 0.75, but you're wrong. So for the city manager, the city manager thinks they've improved, All right, because maybe the city manager took a sample and they just ended up with a really bizarre sample but they are wrong. Describe a type 2 error in this context. All right, again, the city manager collects some data. <clears throat> Maybe they get a bizarre sample, but this would be the paramedics have improved, all right, so they have gotten better, but the city manager doesn't realize it. All right, and then D says, which is more serious and justify your answer? All right, you know, that can change depending on the, on the situation. I would say in this one that the type 1 is probably more serious. Um, and the reason would be because they stop trying to improve. when they haven't actually gotten better. But you could also make an argument that the type 2 error could be pretty serious as well. Um, maybe the city manager ends up spending millions of dollars to improve things or maybe the city manager ends up firing all sorts of people because they haven't improved or because they think they haven't improved when they actually have. So there's not like one right or wrong answer, which is more serious, type 1 or type 2. Um, you kind of just have to like sort of look at the situation and, and sort of assess it. You know, if you're the paramedic that gets fired because the city manager didn't think you improved, then you would say that a type 2 error is, is way more serious. Um, so it sort of depends on your perspective on, on something like this. All right.
Next, let's take a look here. Jeffrey and Tanya want each want to test if the proportion of adults in their state, not stat, um, who have graduated from college is 0.6 as claimed in the newspaper. Jeffrey takes a random sample of 200 adults and uses a significance threshold of 0.01. All right, this little alpha symbol is what we're going to use when we're doing our significance level or our threshold value. All right. While Tanya takes a sample of 200 adults and uses an alpha of 0 0.05. Suppose the newspaper's percentage is actually right. So they're both doing a hypothesis test. This right here is true according to the problem. All right, so we're telling you ahead of time that this is true. And then it says, A, is it possible for Jeffrey or Tanya to make a type one error? If so, who is more likely to do it? So the first question there, is it possible for them to make a type one error? All right, that goes back to our little chart here. All right, so if we look at this chart, they told us in the problem that the null was true. All right, they said the newspaper's statistic was correct. So if the null is true, the only possibility is to make a type 1 error. It's impossible for us to make a type 2 error because type 2 errors only happen when the null is false and you don't realize it. All right, so yes, we can make a type 1 error here because the null is true. So if we go back here, is it possible for Jeffrey or Tanya to make a type 1 error? Yes, because the null is true and they might mistakenly reject it. And then it says, if so, who is more likely to do it? All right, that's where this threshold value is going to come in. All right, remember, we reject the null when your p-value is less than this threshold value. All right, when your p-value is under that threshold or your alpha level, um, that's when we reject the null. So, for Jeff, we only reject the null when the p-value is under 1%. With Tanya, we reject the null when the p-value is under 5%. So who's more likely to make this error? It's going to be Tanya, because she's rejecting the null anytime her p-value is under 5%, whereas Jeff is only rejecting it when it's under 1%. All right, so Tanya, and it's because... Her alpha level is higher. And then question B, is it possible for Jeffrey or Tanya to make a type 2 error? If so, who is more likely to do so? And again, this brings us back to that chart that we just looked at. But because the problem tells us the null is true, it's impossible to make a type 2 error, all right? Type 2 errors are when the null is false and you don't realize it. In this problem, the null is not false. It tells us the null is true, so it's impossible for us to make a type 2 error. All right, so if so, who is more likely to do it? It doesn't really matter because no, it's impossible to make a type 2 error when the null is true. All right, so all we've got left is the back of this and then we are done for the day. All right, so Thinking through type 1 errors. 
A type 1 error happens when the null hypothesis is true, but we reject it. All right, that's kind of what we started with. To reject the null, the p-value has to be less than the alpha level. All right. This happens, we reject a true null, with a probability exactly equal to the alpha level. All right. So what's happening here is we've got sort of our normal distribution. And this curve shows us all of the possible samples. All right, so in theory, any of these samples can happen, but if we happen to get one of the samples down in our rejection zone, we're saying that we're going to reject the null. Now, those samples are possible. Like, there's no reason they can't happen. They're just super unlikely, and they're so unlikely that we're saying, hey, this is probably not the right curve. It could be. We could just have an unlucky sample, but odds are this is actually the wrong curve that we're using, and our, our null is, is not correct. So when we pick the alpha level, you are setting the probability of a type 1 error. So if I set alpha equal to 0.05, then I have a 5% chance of making a type 1 error. All right, because it's the 5% of the curve that's over here. Again, it's not likely that my sample was in here. You know, it's more likely that my sample, my population has an entirely different curve, but it could be that I ended up in this, this rejection zone just by bad luck, and then I'm making a type 1 error. Now, type 2 errors, it's a little harder to calculate the probability of a type 2 error. Um, and actually, there's not one probability. It's sort of changed and it shifts. And in this course, we're not actually going to worry about calculating it, but we do want to conceptually kind of understand um, what it involves. All right, so the first part of that is talking about this idea of the effect size. So the effect size is the standardized difference All right, and when we say standardized difference, it's kind of like when we do like a z-score. So you don't want to just take the absolute difference because depending on the standard deviation, that absolute difference may or may not be as big as it seems. So the standardized difference between the null hypothesis value and the true value. All right, so that's one idea. And then the second idea is this idea of power, which is going to be a test's ability to correctly reject the null of a given effect size. All right, so this idea of a type 2 error, it depends on how big of a difference you actually care about. So here's what I mean by that. If you're saying the null is that the mean, the proportion is 80% and the true proportion is 0 0.800004, it's really hard to detect that because they're so similar. But you also might not care about that size of difference. So when you're talking about a type 2 error, you have to talk about like how big of an error do you care about. Like, if, the tr if you're saying the true value is 80%, as long as it's within, like, 2 or 3% of that, do you care? Do you not care? Um, because that's going to affect the ability...
the size of your your type 2 error, the odds that you're going to make a type 2 error, because the smaller effect that you want to be able to detect, the more likely you are to make a type 2 error, because it's harder to pick up on those small differences. The larger um, of an effect that you want to detect, the easier it is to do, and the less likely you are um, to make that error. All right, so right here it says B represents the probability of a type 2 error. And I just want to put here smaller effect sizes are harder to detect and usually require larger samples. All right, so again, type 2 error, it's not as straightforward as the type 1 error. Um, and then right here, it says power equals 1 minus B. So if you have a 10% chance of making a type 2 error, then power is 0 0.9. If you have a 2% chance of making a type 2 error, then power is 0.98. And again, this changes based on the effect size you want to detect. And the smaller the effect size you're trying to detect, the higher the odds are you're going to make a type 2 error, which is going to reduce your power. All right. So generally the way this works is the only way to reduce both types of errors at the same time is to increase your sample size. All right. Because normally there's this push and the pull. If you increase the odds of making a type 1 error, you decrease the odds of making a type 2 error. If you try to decrease the odds of making a type 2 error, I mean, if you try to, if you increase the odds of making a type 2 error, you decrease the odds of making a type 1 error. And there's this push and pull. So the only way to reduce both types of error at the same time is to increase sample size. So usually what we do is we choose an alpha level that you're willing to risk, so as high as you're willing to go there, and then as large of a sample size as you can afford. All right, because as large of a sample size as you can afford is going to help reduce type 2 error. So you pick an alpha that you're comfortable with. And again, the alpha is your chance of a type 1 error. And then you get as big of a sample as you can afford because that's going to reduce um, the chances of a type 2 error. And again, it's not, the type 2 error is nothing we're going to have to actually calculate in here, but it's just something you want to kind of conceptually understand that it floats and it changes based on how big of a gap you're trying to detect. Um, and the larger your sample size, the easier it is going to be to detect those gaps. All right, so again, you know, it's much harder to tell the difference between 0.8 and 0.8001 than it is to tell the difference between like 0.8 and 0.6. Um, so the odds of making a type 2 error change based on the size of the gap that you're trying to detect. All right, so that wraps this up for today. I hope this was helpful. Have a great day, um, and I will see you later this week. I mean, not literally see you, but like I'll talk to you later this week. All right, bye.